Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutam Dhammam Sangham Namasami. Well, thank you all for being here and being a wonderful part of this uh, community that's just seeming to be flourishing. Um, I and Yanaka and myself have been looking at this book uh, over the Vasa. Uh, we didn't actually get to the very end of it, but um, it's called Breathing Like a Buddha, and it's by Ajahn Suchito. And I encountered this book um, in digital form uh, about two years ago, the Vasa before last, uh, when it just came out. and. Uh, this is a, a book on Anapanasati, the mindfulness of in and out breathing. But um, it's really kind of a holistic book. It talks about not just the on the cushion practice, but also uh, everyday life and how that supports our practice. But um, I remember when I was reading it, what something really struck me where um, he was talking about um, at one point about Sankara. And at Sankara, he was translated as formations. And he was talking about bodily formations, verbal formation, and mental formation. So that's the Kaya Sankara, Wachi Sankara, and Chitta Sankara. And um, how they can all work together as a team. They could be pulling against one another, or they can be uh, working together. And really what occurred to me is that the Wachi Sankara, this, the verbal formation, this thinking that goes on, it's kind of uh, overtakes our uh, mental landscape. You know, people, when they first come to meditation, and sit on the cushion. They're just some of, some people are just kind of exclaim about, "Wow, look at all these thoughts and how crazy they are!" And they're going every different direction all, all over the place. You know, when you start being aware of that, and then it, then some people get the concept that this verbal formation is the enemy. <laughs> we have to get rid of it in order to be a good meditator. We have to. This is an exaggeration, of course. Squash this <laughs> Wachi Sankara. <laughs> and uh, so, the, and then silence of the mind is the ideal thing and stuff like that. And so that's, that's one extreme. <laughs> the other extreme is just it, it all, allowing it all to go haywire, not worrying about it. And somewhere in the middle is uh, where we practice. So. Um, I'd like to uh, speak about that and how the, the three sankharas that were identified, uh, they're actually uh, in the Asutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 44, the Chula Vedala Sutta talks about these three. And it, as it approaches samadhi, as the mind approaches samadhi, and how they uh, work together. But um, on a practical level, um, bringing awareness to our thoughts um, and, and with kindness and um, learning how to direct our thoughts rather than um, making them the enemy uh, is a, a wholesome approach. And I think we're doing the, this uh, anyway. Most of you are, who have been practicing here for a while have been doing this, but I'm just trying to identify uh, this as, you know, giving it a, a, a label or a title or something like that, whether it's useful or not. But 
Oh, but it's also a way to uh, continue the work with it and respect, have respect for our intellect as an important part of our meditation practice. So um, one way uh, we work with it is uh, discerning the wholesome and unwholesome thoughts. And there was a um, sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya again, and it's a uh, um, number, I think it's number 19, two, two kinds of thoughts. And the Buddha, before his awakening, was dividing his thoughts into wholesome and unwholesome thoughts. And then he saw the danger in the unwholesome thoughts, the thoughts of uh, greed, of cruelty, of ill will. And when he saw that it was harmful to himself and to others, naturally those thoughts were abandoned. They, they diminished. So it's a gradual diminishing of the chaos in the mind by identifying what's helpful and what's harmful. And it's a way to uh, direct our activities, our daily life activities. Our karma is through body, speech, and mind. So mind is a, was a forerunner, forerunner of all things. So you know, what we think comes out in speech, comes out in our actions. So, so what we work to Instead of those three sankharas being scattered and working against one another, we start working on um, unifying them and directing them towards wholesome, the wholesome activity. Um, another aspect of the, the verbal formation is that we may suggest um, things like loving kindness to ourselves. We suggest may I be happy, may others be happy. So we're bringing up this, within ourselves, this uh, um, wholesome qualities. And uh, this impacts the body. So we have the, the verbal formation and then the feeling of metta in the body coming up. So these two, and, the, and also the mind too, the, the brightening of the mind. So the, the body becomes more at ease. Uh, the mind becomes our, more at ease. And this is just a very light suggesting that we're doing this. We can do it throughout our, our activities when we're doing something, or we can um, do this on the cushion. And if we see that ourselves heading into an unwholesome direction, uh, we can gently steer ourselves, even verbally, but that awareness that is still in that, uh, maybe the, the more uh, verbal formation. Also, uh, guarding the sense gates is, a, is a, throughout the daily activities, when we're actively doing things and we see unwholesome mental states arising, if I see greed arising or anger arising uh, in contact with, if I see something that, I, oh, I really want that, <laughs> a strong desire coming up, uh, maybe an unwholesome thought about it, not that I would take it uh, for myself, but so, it, so bringing awareness to that and, and, then, and then steering the, the mind can say, oh, that's, I see greed arising, I see desire arising. Um, and uh, that helps us let go of us, of that. And at the same time, we can be aware of what's going on in the body. The body, there's this tension in the body when there's greed or anger. And so um, we're directing our minds both to the body and, um, and to that verbal formation. And then the, the mental formation, the chitta, uh, becomes calmer because there's not this inner conflict uh, going on, this pulling one way or another. And as that uh, verbal formation starts calming, now we're starting to, things start to become more and more automatic. I, you know, I, I might notice something that's pulling my attention, but then the greed is not 
arising so strongly because I I'm conditioning the mind. The mind is getting conditioned to not be pulled one way, not another way, throughout the daily activities. And then, um, or, or I might feel anger arising and um, I'm alert to it. I'm alert to what's going on in the body because I've brought my attention to it. I think, oh, there's anger. What's going on in the body? I do this repeatedly and then this is calming all of that. This is, uh, um, over time, it becomes more quick. It's like, uh, there's one uh, metaphor uh, where there's a pan in the hot sun. It's just very hot to touch. And then um, drops of water are falling into the pan and they just sizzle and go away. So then the, that greed or that hatred is hitting the pan, and then it uh, just disappears quickly. So, so then the mind is not stirred up, agitated, uh, pulled in a lot of directions, and we uh, become um, more calm and more actually aware of the mind itself as we're doing this process. And this allows us when we sit on the cushion, uh, if we're doing this throughout the day, using this guarding of the mind or this uh, sense restraint, uh, the mind is much more calm just to start with. We don't have to, uh, you know, struggle against a lot of uh, agitation in the mind uh, when we sit to meditate. And as we sit, when we bring ourselves to the cushion, this is how all of these things work together. Once uh, we're sitting in the cushion, the stillness of the mind, the stillness of the body, uh, the body and mind reflect one another. So as the body becomes more still, more relaxed, more at peace, then the mind can be more peaceful. And uh, our verbal formations, or the thoughts, will naturally settle. Uh, we can direct our minds, like I was saying, when, when you sit on the cushion, you might uh, even verbally to yourself, I'm re you know, like however you do it, but feeling the sensation of the weight of the body against the cushion. You can do your, kind of your own guided meditation and uh, or and feeling my feet, uh, I feel some tension in the feet. You know, you can do this verbally to, to begin with, and then, then it just starts, the verbal formation will start, as you do a practice like this, then that can just drop away, and then you're just doing that silently, but there's still that directing of the mind to... Uh, what's called the grosser aspects, which the body, the physical, you know, this physical form as a whole is gross, and then it comes to a more subtle aspect, which is the breath. So it goes from gross, more gross, coarse, to subtle. So this is a gradual path to unific unific unification, excuse me, unification of the mind and the body, including that uh, mental, that uh, verbal formation, which is becoming more and more and more subtle until it seems like it's gone, but it's still there with that directing. In the, in the jhanas, it's a vitaka vichara is called verbal formation, and that uh, doesn't disappear until the second jhana. So, it just becomes more and more subtle, and your awareness of the body disappears at the fourth jhana, so I hear. So, um, this is uh, this gradual process of unification and settling down and quieting all these, these three formations, and... Uh, making use of it, well use of all, all three. 
So I was going to invite Aya Nyanika to add to this uh, concept. She, she may have, or they may have uh, some uh, words to say about this. I think what Aya has given us is uh, very rich, so I'll maybe just speak about an example or two that I experienced. Um, early on in practice, you know, I heard things like, oh, and just let the thoughts float by. Yeah. <laughs> my thoughts were not floaty. My thoughts were very sharp, and my thoughts were very persistent, and my thoughts... Um, I was describing to Aya that I kind of felt like I walked through life thinking about relaying verbally my experience of either now or something that happened in the past to someone in the future. <laughs> and I would do that on the cushion too. You know, this meditation is like this. I'm going to report it to my teacher and they're going to react like this and then I'm going to have the most brilliant thing to say or then I'm going to have to have them save me or... You know, so that was the thought, and then I thought, oh, then I'm supposed to cut all those thoughts off. And so I became violent with my mind. Anyone else done this? Yeah, it's a mistake. <laughs> so eventually, I, you know, you do that long enough, you, you hit your head long enough with the thinking inside the skull or wherever we're thinking. And you start to wonder if there's another way, which is what the Buddha luckily offered us. And over time, I started realizing, oh, A, I'm doing this. A, I have this verbal vacha um, habit. Um, and I keep, I'm supposed to go to the in and out breath of the body, right? So cut the thinking. <sighs> I'm th am I breathing right? <sighs> Deep, no, no, I'm not supposed to direct, the, you know, and so I'm directing my practice. And so I'm just iterating, this is normal. <laughs> so for anyone who's in this, this is normal. And over time I realized, oh, okay, what is this sensation and experience of thinking like this, breathing like this, where I'm, I'm forcefully attending, I'm being aware, I'm being mindful, right? It's dukkha. This has the flavor of, of stress when I'm attending to my practice this way. And luckily I encountered teachers who began to say things like, relax. And so I began to relax around it and that gave me enough space, enough safety to begin to wonder about why do I have all this verbal chit chat going and this so much importance in getting my story right so that I could tell it in a way that would be helping me, right? And I began to see my underlying tendencies and they may be different for you. I had a big one around safety. You know, my verbal story was going to make me acceptable. It was going to make me part of the in-meditation crowd. It was going to help me relate to my meditation teacher. It was going to help me help others in the world. Um, and I would be okay <laughs> because I was doing all my thinking right. And then I realized I've probably been doing, well, I knew I'd been doing this for a long time. This, this was my life habit. And I have enough confidence that this has probably been a habit in many lifetimes. So of course it's going to take a while for my thoughts to get to those soft, cloud, wispy things. It's not something that's just going to happen. And I needed to begin to be kinder to myself. And so I began to go, Oh, sweetheart, of course. Of course you're thinking right now. What if, so I'm using verbal, as I was saying in a skillful way, what if we just let it soften a little bit? 
Yeah, and it took me a while to get to what if we, I would say, soften. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. So this is a process of showing up where we are. And for me, I was still very, very much in the verbal land. And then as I began to explore, what are the causes and conditions that got me into this verbal zone, this tight body, this, when I pay attention to the breathing, I take control of the breathing. You know, and you know, notice I haven't even talked about chitta, <laughs> the mind, because I was so caught up in those aspects. But I began to eventually look at what the, the chitta sankara, the mentals, of how am I perceiving things? What are my perceptions like? What is feeling tone like? And as I began to open up and explore and have enough capacity to begin to see those sankharas, I began to have the little ahas. Oh, oh, my perception is twisted up in my sense of safety. And like for others, so fear, fear based for me, others have, you know, more of a greed or a pushing away or, you know, you'll have your particular flavor that you find. And when you see the flavor that's driving you, that's where you can begin to have the space to say, what if I held this kindly? How I hold this really matters. So I began to hold it in a way of like, I've been doing this for a very long time. It's going to take a while for it to unwind. And I'm not going to take it so seriously. It's a very serious practice, but for as long as I've been doing it, of course, it's like this. As I began to introduce those ways of verbalizing, I became softer, kinder to myself and those around me. And the thing began to quiet down. And eventually there came a day where I was reporting to a meditation teacher. I'm like, and the thoughts, they were just kind of wispy. And I wasn't really grabbing onto them. They just kind of floated by. I didn't need to feed them. I no longer had that drive. I'm not saying it's that way all the time. But my basic disposition for the thinking was the softening. And then as it softened, I began to really enjoy that soft, gentle quality of just being with, letting it go by, being with, letting it settle. And then I was able to come into the breath and not control it. The breath just was breathing. The body was just bodying. The thoughts were just thoughting. So this is a way that I would work into that. Um, I'm not really sure. We had another analogy, but it, I'm not sure it really fits here. What? The, what? the the child one. Oh. Should I say that one anyway? Even though it's not. Okay. Oh, so this is a, a just so beautiful um, explanation, further kind of personal experience of uh, what we we're talking about, and what we were talking about um, privately, just the two of us thinking about this, is that um, treating the mild mind like it's a small child, and then you um, direct, this is a, um, you see a, there's a, you have a child you're responsible for, your, you know, your child or someone you're looking after. And um, you keep it occupied, you keep the child occupied, but the children have a tendency to get into mischief. So this is my metaphor, and you can tell your story after this, because it's a good story, it's an excellent example. But the... Uh, um, so if you're watching a child well, then the child probably won't get into mischief. But small children, you're in a park and they'll get excited and they may start running towards the street. And sometimes you do, do have to physically apprehend them so, um, to stop them. And, and so sometimes you have to be a little bit more forceful with the mind if you see it really going 
bad direction. <laughs> but mostly you want to be gentle, you know, you keep a good eye on the children and then uh, they won't get into mischief. And another idea about this is the children are a little bit older and they're in the room together and you're in another part of the house and you hear all this ruckus. And all you have to do is walk um, to the room and open the door and stand at the doorway and the children are gonna settle down. So this is like, you know, you see the mind, like at a certain point as your mind matures, you just, all you, instead of having to apprehend it and say, ah, bad idea, um, just bringing that awareness directly to what's going on in the mind. And like if I just say, oh, even just a little cue, that's greed or that's anger or that's, that's you know, will, you know. And so then it s stops it and it tracks. So this is the, the metaphor of uh, being a, a kind, intelligent, gentle, sometimes just a tiny little nudge or just your attention is going to help with the mind to settle. So uh, now here comes the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely having a tag team. I get to do the storytelling part. <laughs> um, so this happened to me when I was a uh, young teen. I was babysitting. And so this is the story of uh, me with a toddler, not quite two, I think, if I'm remembering right. And we, we were mostly, I was doing the babysitting here in Washington State where there's not a whole lot of scary things that are, might be on your front porch. But the family took me with them to Florida for <laughs> them to help pack up the grandma and move to Washington. And so I was the caretaker for this small child who does all those things, running around, et cetera, et cetera. And that day, I was opening up the front door to let the child out into the front yard. We were going to go out to play. And there was a small rattlesnake coiled on the stoop. I did not say, oh, little um, child. I won't use the name. I'll an adult now. I probably wouldn't mind. Um, oh, oh, little child, let's not step out and um, onto a snake. The snake might blah, 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 blah. No, I had my arms under his you know, armpits. I had him lifted up over my head and behind me, and I had reached for the door and closed it so that we were still on one side of the door and the snake was on the other. Um, and that was the appropriate measure at that time. Of course, I, I, it was with all goodwill in my heart, and definitely some cortisone. Um, that adrenaline, that's the word. Yeah, also good to have a nurse. <laughs> um, so I, I was forceful in pick the child up, move the child, set the child down, close the door, and then say, I think we won't go out that door right now. So this is a completely appropriate use of um, body, mind, and speech, and knowing when to speak, when to act, and to still do it with that kindness, because you will have times where, whoa, going down that track is leading to stepping on a snake. Let's not do it. So that snake may be ill will or um, greed or something, and. Sometimes you just have to, yeah, there, there are times when you just have to say, nope. <laughs> and there are other times when you can be really gentle and uh, take it slowly. For the most part, we want to, uh, it's a gradual path. It's not meant to uh, be forceful. And that, and that was done with utmost kindness and protection. So then the mind is going to get that quick too. You'll see the danger really quickly and then you'll say, no, can't go there. Because um, we've burnt ourselves too many times so we know not to reach into the fire. So are we about up with time? How are we doing with time? Yes? Andamayam damakatayu sadhu karam Sadhu, 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 anumodami. Thank you, Ayas. Well, thank you, too, for inviting us.
We do have a chance for Q&A. If people want to raise their hand, we'll bring a mic over to you. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand as well. I got one here. Hey. Um, in your talk, you were grouping anger with, uh, I think it was greed and ill will. And I think of greed and ill will as things that are never wholesome, that kind of the goal, the aim is to kind of diffuse them in a way. And I'm wondering if anger can ever be wholesome or used uh, in a way that's skillful uh, and how you, how you see that. Well, I once heard His Holiness the Dalai Lama say that hatred was never, and anger and hatred were never wholesome. And I think um, there's an idea of forcefulness being, uh, it can be effective. You know, I could, the analogy of a child too, I could be yelling at the child and, and hitting the child and stuff, and short run the child may behave. But then there's these emotional scars, and uh, yeah, it, it doesn't, in the long run, it's not helpful. It just causes more harm. So, um, and it causes harm for ourselves. Uh, the Buddha likened it to uh, hot coals. If there's like a bed of hot coals in front of us, and we grab the coals with our bare hands and then throw it at somebody else, this is the anger. So we're picking up this something that's going to burn us, to harm us, that hurts us. So we have to really um, see in, in ourselves, when, when we're feeling angry or hateful, what the impact on our body is. So um, it's going to harm us, whether we, you know, whether our aim is good or bad, and we hit the other person with the coals, we're going to get burnt picking up those coals. So um, there may, we may see, oh, could be. The, the, the best thing I think that anger and hatred could be triggering is our awareness that, oh, we still have work to do. And also, oh, um, something is not right here. And then we, we try to act and speak in a way that isn't going to cause harm for ourselves and others, and I, you know, I could, I could be angry at other, another person's behavior because they're harming somebody or somebody that I love. How do I approach this without anger? How can I? Um, and if I approach somebody angrily, often they won't want to hear me. They'll just want to fight back. So either I'm, I'm, I'm oppressing somebody else in the, uh, like the case of a child. You know, if I'm using my anger to really try to force behavior, then that's really oppression. And if I'm using anger trying to solve a problem with another person who is an adult, they'll, they'll retaliate back with maybe more anger unless they're a really well-developed person. Um, so um, I think just... Uh, yeah, as soon as we can, uh, set the, the anger down, but bring it, not being in denial. Because this is a, uh, I think we're hardwired as, as beings, you know, a, a sentient beings, to have this, because it does, it is a forceful thing, like to protect one's young or territory or something like that. Anger is going to bring up adrenaline, and then we're going to, uh, we can, you know, fight harder. <laughs> But uh, uh, the Buddha is trying to steer us away from just being animals. We're going to try to bring our, our uh, consciousness above that animal realm, not just to be in, you know, getting for ourselves and protecting ourselves. So, um, so no, it's never a wholesome thing. Thank you for your question. Can I say something else? Certainly. Just uh, to echo what Aya said, um, there was a BBC special where they asked quite a few religious leaders from different traditions about anger. And the Dalai Lama was the only one who responded that it's never wholesome. And I think that does come across as a bit confusing to some folks because sometimes there's woven into anger, you know, really um, important 
feelings of uh, something needs to be done, you know, clarity, um, deep values being compromised, call to action and energy. And just to say those things all can be unwoven from anger and used skillfully, and that's the Buddhist view. But as monastics, in our monastic code, we can't admonish another monastic, or we're not supposed to until we're speaking honestly at the right time from a heart of loving kindness. I know one monastic who's had to wait a whole year before that was fulfilled, and after asking permission. And it's amazing, like if you even have a little bit of venting your spleen um, when you talk to someone, it just, people pick it up so easily and it changes everything. So I think this is one of the Buddha's most powerful and unique insights is hatred is um, never stilled through hatred. This is eternal law. And um, the Buddha said there's three kinds of mind. There's the mind like stone where words scratched in uh, take a long time to fade. And that's like one who's angered quickly and anger takes a long time to fade. And then there's one with the mind like sand, which you can write words and then they'll fade quickly with the wind. And that's like one who's angered quickly um, but the anger fades quickly. And then there's one with a mind like water, and that's one who um, hears harsh words but is almost not touched at all. And I think he says then he maintains kind relations with that person. <laughs> and um, that's just such a beautiful image. And it's a good point about how to work with uh, verbal fabrication, as you can imagine, writing the words on water as well. So. Yeah, I just think that's an especially unique and important insight into election season is I know someone just yesterday who was approached by someone who made a really harsh statement about a political candidate and um, this person just responded saying, you know, that's quite a thing to say and I really think that, you know, hatred is never stilled through hatred. This is eternal law and if you bring in the Buddha's, I mean, that's, your, that's a yard sign, so... Um, I think that's a really important question and an important insight too. I has anything to add? The addition is very brief. You will be surprised at how powerful love is. When you are really living out of an unbounded love, you have a lot of power and it will be far, far more effective than anger ever could be. Over there. Thank you. Um, in light of all that, and in light of the political situation and all of that stuff, my question is, what is anger's opposite, and how do we in moments of anger, how do we turn to that opposite? He's asking what's the opposite of anger? Um, so um, kindness is the opposite of, and compassion, actually they two uh, really work together well. Um, how do we cultivate those? Well, um, if we're prone to anger, um, for me, what was helpful was to see um, the damage it was causing me physically and psychologically. And then um, bringing that uh, kindness and compassion to myself. So um, naturally, when we see the harm, it, we, it's, uh, it, it's a habit energy that may come up again and again and again. So patience, too. Patience is really, I mean, how many people have gotten really angry because they have to wait a long period of time and they weren't expecting that they had to? And then what's wrong with the world and why isn't the world treating me better by letting me be on time? So this is a way to generate anger. So if we want to generate um, patience, then it'll help us to um, not develop anger. So to, looking at ways to, uh, 
diminish our anger is one thing, because we can't have loving kindness, we can't have thoughts of kindness if we're, over, it's, we're overpowered all the time by uh, anger and hatred. So we need to, at least to keep it in abeyance for a long enough period of time to bring up a, a heart of compassion and loving kindness. So this is a this is a starting point, and just really assess ourselves. Not everybody <laughs> has that same starting point of of uh, just. Uh, I, w I was one that was really quick to anger, and then I would uh, stay for long periods of time, and it was, it was hard for me to set it down. And I was trying to forcefully set it down, and that was a mistake. So just to bring awareness to it, and then it does naturally fade by itself. If we go to the body instead of that mental story of how the world is treating us wrong or whatever, and, um, and then uh, bringing that love to ourselves first, that kindness to ourselves, that patience with ourselves, and then uh, the body, both the body and the mind, the kindness and patience to our body and mind. And then uh, the Buddha says that, uh, um, that all beings hold themselves dear. So there's a part of us that does hold ourselves dear, even though we've obscured it with anger and hatred. So a lot of people have self-hatred, but we do care for ourselves we actually do, there's a, you know, deep caring that, like, we get up in the morning and wash our face and breathe, brush our teeth and care for ourselves, feed ourselves. So there's that caring for ourselves. And then knowing that um, all, de all beings hold themselves dear, then we can see as ourself as an example uh, that we don't want to be harmed. We don't want to be treated cruelly. And it's the same with all beings, even the tiniest little ant. I think us developing sensitivity to other beings, knowing, oh, even this little ant or this fly, I'm trying to capture it to put it outside, and it, I see it's frightened. And then I start learning ways to, to transport insects to very carefully and without terrifying them. You know, you, you get more and more sensitive. So if you're sensitive to uh, yourself and knowing that all beings have this uh, cherishing of their own lives and wanting to be safe and wanting love and wanting care, then it starts extending up to, to all beings. So that it's an antidote uh, to hatred, and how to, uh, some ideas and uh, ways to cultivate. There's many other ways of uh, uh, firming phrases like, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be peaceful, and then extending that to all beings, may all beings be happy, may all beings be well, may all beings be peaceful, and that's using that wachi sankara, the, <laughs> the verbal formation to help transform and uh, I think a number of people uh, work with these phrases. And for me, it, I found them um, helpful. And just uh, when I see my mind m r running amok, then I can say, oh, the, this isn't a cause for happiness. How can I, be, how can I bring happiness to my heart? <laughs> so um, I don't know if either one of you uh, everything that I have said with an example now of when we ask about what is the opposite of anger, a lot of times if you hear the answer is metta, it's a loving kindness, it feels kind of not so powerful. You know, it doesn't have that. Um, so what we often need to also cultivate is a capacity a resourcedness, a, an ability to stand in this. And so in that, 
So I have a practice where I'm breathing, taking up space, really grounding, really aware of the body, but what it, with this soft movement and then an expansiveness. So it's that unboundedness of the Brahma Viharas. And it, I mean, these are gods, Brahmas. They're not wussy. <laughs> And so when I'm cultivating this resourcedness, this stability, this openness, and my heart is, is wide and open and a radically accepting of all that is right there that I could be angry about, it's like this, and now I am resourced to apply love to it so that there can be a shift. So I can potentially be an instrument of change without attachment. But you get so resourced and strong and powerful that love and power become a synonym. And that is an, not, not just an opposite of anger. It's something that can act and move without attachment, without self. It can be a natural flow of your Dhamma practice, meeting what you're meeting, when you're voting and when you're interacting with the, the times we're in. But you can't do that if you're grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> so start there. So start there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when uh, I was talking about not feeling like her thoughts floating by were very cloudy, I kept thinking of the uh, the flying monkeys and Wizard of Oz, and uh, <laughs> speaking of anger. But I also just, um, to add to those beautiful reflections, um, right intention, the Buddha said, was non-ill will, non-cruelty, and renunciation. And, you know, that's a helpful bar, because it's not saying you have to be filled with loving kindness. It's just saying, can you put down, can you abide in non-ill will at least that much? And I think sometimes the opposite of anger is just patience and patient endurance. Like Longpur Sumedha said, peaceful coexistence with the unwished for. Um, and, and honestly, like anger's kind of this fire, you know, and, um, and the Buddha also said it's, you know, honeyed, honey tipped and poisoned root. Um, but I think really understanding that when the anger comes up, the impulse is to, you know, buy into the storyline or express it. And if you can just be patient through that feeling of boiling with right view and poise, um, you do come out softer. Like that is in itself effacement. Um, it's like you're simmering. And so like, just to really know that if you're, if the anger comes up and you're able to not buy into the storyline and just let the heat kind of fade over time, but just not act, not repress, but suppress the action, um, that's good practice. And sometimes I think that's what we have. And then the other one is gratitude for really looking at if people didn't push our buttons, if there weren't these difficult situations, then how would the heart grow in capacity? So like this is our practice, is this is how we broaden the heart. And I think sometimes, you know, that, that sense of gratitude is the perfect opposite as well. Um, but yeah, Ajahn Brahmali says the chief focuses of mindfulness should be keeping your uh, ethics, your virtue, and not dwelling in ill will. Those two things, because the ill will, it's just such a constant hum for so many. And the ability to know that that's natural and a big part of everyone's practice is just trying not to buy into it over time. And that's how the heart becomes soft and kind, but it takes a good long, I call practice the slow boil. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more. That was beautiful, thank you, yes. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, so this is, uh, my name's James, by the way. This is a continuation of the ill will question, or what you were saying. It sounds like to me when you speak of not having ill will, it's, it sounds like, um, like a very general thing. I'm curious on how not to have ill will towards someone, let's say, who's abused you as a child, because it seems uh, 
like that would be the right thing to do. It seems like the only thing to do. So how would you, I guess, avoid that, or how do you deal with that? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So one thing to keep in mind is that there's a, we're all kind of uh, sometimes the victims of causes and conditions, and that the perpetrator may have been also abused as a child. It's hard to know what happened. Uh, in their childhood, the reason why they're treated that way. It could have been external, like society abusing them even. And so, um, so to have compassion for yourself that you had that experience. And um, I, I had gone through therapy and I said to myself, oh, the buck stops here, I'm not going to perpetuate abuse down the line any further is stopping here and stopping the internal abuse and uh, if we have hatred or we have resentment <clears throat> then we're we're only harming ourselves it doesn't it doesn't erase the past and when i see myself remembering something and it's almost like the memory and the emotion are tangled together and so the anger and the resentment we had as a child, or the fear, or whatever it is, is tangled into that memory. And that comes, they come up together like a package. And then, uh, so to see that, to see it as a, like one big package, this, and uh, so we have compassion for ourselves. Oh, this is a, and this is a memory. This happened in the past. Uh, I'm an adult now. I'm not in that situation. We're going to have to talk ourselves through it and say, oh, okay. Um, bringing the awareness to the body in the present moment. I'm sitting here in this room, looking around. I'm not there anymore. This is the past. Uh, and then uh, eventually we can get to a point where we can forgive. But... Um, yeah, to be gentle with ourselves. Uh, but allow, I love that uh, metaphor of the boiling and the same thing with the feeling uh, in the body, being aware of the, uh, of the emotion and to take the story away. And I've done that with, a, with a more current situations in my, my adulthood when I, I, many years ago, with, resentment towards a person and there was that story that came up again and again and again and I just said I'm setting down the story I'm setting down the story and then it felt like there was a war zone inside of my body I could feel the I could feel the raw anger in my body and I just stayed with it and allowed it to fade so it's not like we we're going to just we I, you know, we have a switch internally that we can just turn off our emotions. That doesn't work. And uh, that verbal formation, the, the, the story, those things um, are easier to let go of than that raw emotion. So if you take time, you might cry. You might feel the anger in the body. Uh, but over time, it's going to dissipate. If you're just patient and then bring uh, loving kindness to yourself and do things that are affirming to, for yourself to help yourself. Maybe talking to friends, sometimes a, uh, a support group or somebody who's had similar situations helps. But um, in the Dhamma, I think uh, there, even if they haven't had a similar situation, people are compassionate. And you might just say, I'm really having a hard time today. I'm really feeling angry or I'm really feeling depressed or whatever it is, and then share that with others. Uh, and uh, get help. Yeah, they, just a, a compassionate ear or something like that is also helpful. You don't have to do it, you know, like all by all alone. It's not. This is the beauty of community: is that we don't have to do any of this 
alone. I'll say my brother took up this um, others from the Buddha is that others will harm, I will not harm. And so he took up the, uh, just a commitment. He still had so much rage inside, and I know he's okay with me saying this. He would say, what would our stepfather have done And when he's working with his own children? I'm not going to do that. So number one, there's a commitment a deep commitment to an ethical conduct to change the behavior. Number two, there is a sense of self-healing, which I has spoke a lot about. Absolutely important, because we, we want to be integrated beings as we awaken. We're not going to leave part of ourselves out. So I'm not going to repeat what I has already said. The third one, uh, when my stepfather was nearing his death, my sister said, and it was a, not a good death. She said, I don't care what he did to us. No one deserves to be treated like this. So what was arising in her was compassion. And that was out of you know, a time of, of really looking and experiencing and seeing this person who did horrible things as a human being who was conditioned, as I was saying, was conditioned to have committed these offenses, but still to have an open enough heart because of our own self-healing, that we're open to our own self. Now, and the third thing was safety. I did not go back and help him. I loved him now from a distance, but I did not put myself back in a position. So I, uh, we did not harm others. We did not continue to harm ourselves. And we opened our hearts so we could see this person as a human being who needed our love too. I hope that's a very brief synopsis of a long, long time of work. Thank you.